Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it is, obviously we're all in a good mood here. Um, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. This is episode 98 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson. And for the next eh, almost half hour, I'm gonna be ranting away at you about things that are important to me and I think are deserving of your attention. Comments, questions, reactions should be sent to me directly. Hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL uh, AOL.com. That is the email address. And since I'm sure you didn't catch that, you can check out my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be displayed eh, somewhere in there a couple times during the show. You can get the email address from there. Uh, I do answer my email. Uh, sometimes I'll slow about it, but I do answer it. I do ask, however, that uh, if you send me email, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something along those lines in the, in the subject line so that I know it's not spam, of which I get way too much. All right, we're going to start, as I always like to start whenever I can, with uh, some good news. And I got two bits of good news this week. The one is that, as I expect that you've already heard, the Violence Against Women Act has been renewed after uh, having been delayed and stalled for over a year. The Violence Against Women Act was originally passed in 1994. It was renewed in both 2000 and 2005, I believe it was, uh, with nice bipartisan majorities. But this time, the reactionaries objected to the fact that this version of the act wanted to protect more women. Uh, specifically, it included protections for women in same-sex relationships, for Native American women, and for undocumented immigrant women. As a result of that opposition, the law died with the expiration of the last Congress and had to be reintroduced in this one. However, the Senate very quickly acted to reintroduce and pass that bill with, again, surprise, surprise, bipartisan support. It passed 78 to 22. The House, however, was not interested. Uh, the right-wingers petulantly stamped their feet over the, uh, over the expanded protections. However, it rather quickly became obvious that this is a political loser for them. Uh, and that we discovered there is a degree of political intensity that can penetrate even their skulls. And so the Gopper leadership in the House engineered uh, a means by which the, the wackos could say they supported the Violence Against Women Act without actually having to do it, which was to offer a substitute stripped of the additional protections which everyone knew would not pass. In fact, it failed on a vote of uh, 166 to 257 against. Okay, so now enough of the wackos have been given uh, a basis to, to cover their butts. Uh, the House then voted on the Senate version of the bill, which again passed with bipartisan support 286 to 138. Obama is expected to sign the bill into law on March 7th. That's the day after I'm taping this, so probably it's already happened by the time you've seen this. Now, all of that is, it's good news. It just simply is good news. There is a little bit of a sidebar to this. 257 members of the House voted no on the first version of this, and 138 voted no on the second. Allowing for the fact that there were 11 or 12 members of the House who didn't vote, this means, do the math, this means that at a minimum, at a minimum, 102 members of the House voted against both versions. That at least 102 members of the House of Representatives wanted there to be no Violence Against Women Act. Add that to the 22 senators who voted against it, and there are at least 124, and hypothetically as many as 171, members of Congress who want there to be no Violence Against Women Act. Uh, you may have come a long way, baby, but we've still got miles to go before we sleep. Okay, the second bit of good news I wanted to bring up. It appears that a baby born with the HIV virus has been what doctors are calling functionally cured. In the words of Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institutes of Health, he said, if this is not a cure, it's the closest thing to a cure that we've seen. The case involves a child from Mississippi whose mother was not diagnosed as HIV positive until she was in labor. When the child was born with the virus, 
the child was treated aggressively immediately. The child's now two and a half, has been off meds for about a year, and there's no sign of infection. In fact, even after sophisticated testing, all that they can detect is a few remnant scraps of the virus's DNA, which appear to not be replicating. Now, it's important to note this is not a cure in the normally understood colloquial sense. This is not going to help people who already have AIDS. This is rather a way to keep the virus, the HIV virus, from getting established in the body in the first place. Uh, it, uh, it's a, this is then of particular importance to infants, uh, and it does provide a new avenue for investigation, a new avenue for research. Even if you include, by the way, the limiting adjective functional, this is still the second and only the second cure for HIV that's known. The other is a guy named Timothy Ray Brown of San Francisco. Uh, he was HIV positive. He's been off his meds for five years now with no sign of infection after he underwent a risky bone marrow transplant from one of the rare people who appears to be naturally resistant to the virus. More than 330,000 children worldwide were born with the AIDS virus, uh, with HIV, in 2011. That's mostly in poor countries because 60% of the pregnant women there do not have access to the treatment that would keep the virus from being passed from them onto their fetuses. In the U.S., such births are rare and have actually declined 90% since the 1990s because HIV testing and treatment is now a routine part of prenatal care. Care which, it should be noted, this woman did not get because apparently she is both rural and poor, two major strikes against anybody hoping to get adequate medical and health care. Which is why, frankly, screw Obamacare. We don't need Obama. What we need is a national health care system, one that does not depend on private insurance or, in fact, on any kind of insurance at all, and one that would focus on who is underserved rather than who is underinsured. Okay, moving from there to one of our regular weekly features, this is the Clown Award. And guess what? This week, there's a tie, just like the Oscars. This is a tie. I had two that I couldn't decide which one was more clownish. So the first big red nose of the week goes to Missouri State Representative Rick Bratton, a self-proclaimed self huge science buff who recently introduced a bill into the Missouri legislature uh, to require the bogus notion of intelligent design and what the bill calls destiny get the same educational treatment and the same textbook space in Missouri schools as does the theory of evolution. Now, that's not enough for the Clown Award. No, because lots of bozos, or in this case, bozo wannabes, uh, lots of bozo wannabes have done the same thing. In fact, in Missouri, there is another bill uh, doing the by now standard end run around the uh, ban on the constitutional ban on introducing religion into the classrooms by saying that it's about teaching the strengths and weaknesses of various theories. And by the way, there's one in Oklahoma that even says that teachers cannot be, uh, teachers, uh, it'll be illegal for teachers to penalize a student by giving a lower grade, apparently, to any student that turns in work insisting that some other explanation other than evolution is actually the true one. No, no, so, so no, no, that's not Bratton's claim to the red nose. It rather rela uh, rests on two points. The first is that he argues that numerous college professors within biology, school science teachers, are banned from the science uh, community because they want to teach creationism instead of evolution. To which I say, good. Now that's a single, that's a solid single. This, however, is a home run. First, you have to understand, in science, a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for an effect or a process that's based on observation and data and can be tested by further observation and experimentation. It could be called, it could be thought of as um, an educated or better yet, a well-informed guess. 
And Bratton's bill, a hypothesis, is defined as something that reflects, quote, a minority of scientific opinion and is philosophically unpopular. That's what a th that's for him what a uh, hypothesis is. Now, in science, a theory, this is an important word, a theory is an explanation of something in nature that has been well established through repeated observation and experiment and which usually unites different effects or processes under a single explanation. In Bratton's bill, a scientific theory is, quote, an inferred explanation whose components are data, logic, and faith-based philosophy. And finally, the bill refers to the events and processes that define the future of the universe, galaxies, stars, our solar system, earth, plant life, animal life, and the human race. Now, most scientists would refer to that as, as physical, chemical, and biological processes. His bill defines that as destiny. Rick Bratton's destiny is to be a clown. Uh, our other clown this week is Bryant Kamenker, or Kamenker, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I keep wanting to say it's canker sore, but I won't do that. But Kamenker, or Kamenker, of mass resistance. This is a collection of anti-gay bigots who unhappily prove that Massachusetts is not immune to that particular infection. On February 15th, the Massachusetts Department of Education issued a new set of rules for teachers on how to handle transgender student issues, such as bathroom use and um, uh, sports team affiliation and so on. Among the guidance is that teachers should not confront a student's parents about this. The reason for that, I'm quoting Carlos Maza of Equality Matters. Studies have shown that over half of all transgender people experience family rejection, with roughly 20% becoming the victims of domestic violence from a family member after coming out. So you don't tell the parents, they may not know. Well, in response to this, Kamenker put on his big red nose and likened LGBT-friendly school administrators to guards at Nazi concentration camps. In an interview, he told a Christian radio station, I'm quoting here, These school administrators, you know, I mean, you think of them as what the Nazi concentration camp guards must have been like, where they're doing this horrible evil and they're just taking orders or something. Now, this kind of thing is not new for him. Last May, apparently floundering for a way to make uh, support for, for gay rights the same as racism, he made a totally befuddling equation between diversity training and Jim Crow laws. Still, this time, he reached for the Nazi meme. Now, there's an informal tradition on the internet that if you're engaged in a flame war, the first person who brings up a Nazi reference automatically loses. He went for it, which means in this case, Brian Kamenker is the loser and a clown. All right, next, very quick thing, a short thing. Um, talking about guns. We've been doing, doing this every week for several weeks. Thing is, this, talking about guns was never intended to be a weekly feature. It was intended rather to be a series. Uh, a series to cover various aspects of the issue, including the, the real the reality and the facts of gun violence, about the legal and constitutional issues, and about the pushback against the gun wackos. I've discussed all of that and more over the preceding several weeks. So this is going to be the last installment. I'm sure I'll be talking about guns again. But this is going to be the end of the series, that particular series of talking about guns. So I'm going to wrap up that series with just two very quick things. One is that it was discovered in September of 2012 that the Nutside Rabbit Brains of America, the, the NRA's Institute for Legislative Action, published on its website an enemies list consisting of hundreds of organizations, celebrities, and other national figures, corporations and CEOs, and publications and media outlets that were anti-gun, which apparently meant that at some point they supported gun control. The list included dozens of medical, nursing, and health organizations, which should have told them something about guns, 
but included dozens of medical uh, nursing and health organizations. Uh, it included both the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association. It included some police organizations, a number of church and religious groups, and most major mainstream media outlets, both print and TV. Gun control advocates began pointing to the existence of this list, taking rather delight in this list, one which really proves how far to the radical right the NRA has actually moved. The list has been taken down. It's not at the site anymore. They ran away from their own list. The other thing I'm going to mention here is that as of March 5th, based on an ongoing compilation of newspaper accounts, at least 2,496 people have been killed by guns in the United States since Newtown, 15 of them in Massachusetts. And we are taking a break. We're back. We're back. And uh, welcome back to you. Glad you stayed with us. Um, there was a, there was an RIP this week. And I know you've, you've heard about this, but I want to talk about it a little bit. Uh, Hugo Chavez has died of cancer at the age of 58. Chavez, of course, he was the president of Venezuela. He had just in January been elected to a fourth term. Chavez was kind of a he was almost like a media punching bag in the U.S. He was the, he was the person that, uh, you know, he got betrayed as a clown or a buffoon or, or whatever else. Uh, the fact is that Chavez was much and often unfairly maligned in U.S. media. Uh, in fact, he was subjected to a process that I call demonization. A demonization usually starts with somebody, usually some high government official, saying something about somebody that, you know, implies some evilness about them. That claim is then repeated by the media, amplified by the media, extended by the media, until after a while, anything this person says or does is interpreted in that light. It's interpreted under an assumption that whatever they say or do has some evil, nefarious purpose. Uh, as one example of the results of this, when Chavez died, uh, a Boston Herald editorial about the death called Chavez a strong man, an international thug who used his nation's oil wealth to buy friends, and a bully who supported Hezbollah and bankrupted Venezuela, all within the space of 300 words. The thing is, once a leader is demonized, uh, even the clearly beneficial things they do, which, I mean, in Chavez's case, that would be things like expanding education, health care, and food assistance for the poor, and bringing them into the political process for the first time. Even the clearly beneficial things they do are regarded as somehow nefarious. Again, in Chavez's case, it was um, that he was doing these things in order to buy their votes. It's always odd that when poor people get stuff, it's buying their votes. When rich people get stuff, it's because they deserve the assistance. But uh, it was to buy their votes to increase his personal power. Chavez was repeatedly accused of press censorship and of closing down the opposition press, even as there always remained an opposition press to complain about the press being closed down. His government was described as increasingly authoritarian so many times that there must have been some people who thought that was part of some official title. In fact, back in the summer of 2004, I wrote this. I'm quoting myself here. Chavez has been repeatedly accused of authoritarianism, of being an autocrat, a murderer, even a would-be dictator, in the words of the New York Times. The charge is not completely without merit, but still over the top, especially since authoritarian rule always seems to be increasing, but never actually seems to get to the point of being authoritarian. Nearly nine years later, that remains exactly the same. It remains true. Chavez's authoritarian rule was always arriving, but never actually arrived. And think, here's something very important to note here. Very important to note. It wasn't just the right wing that attacked Chavez. No, the liberals did it too. Chavez was the lefty they loved to hate, the one they could and would attack in order to prove that, by gosh, they were not dirty hippies. 
So from time to time, all good liberals would engage in a little Chavez bashing, a little demonizing, something to prove that they were really serious observers of foreign policy who hadn't strayed too far from the foreign policy consensus, uh, and that their disagreements where they exist are over matters of effectiveness and advisability, not over any fundamental difference in philosophy, and certainly not from any questions about basic principles, and absolutely not from any doubt that the U.S. remains morally superior to every other nation in history on Earth. Hugo Chavez was no demon. He was no angel, certainly. And uh, some of his actions raised genuine civil liberties concerns, and he was criticized by human rights groups on various counts. Uh, so he was no angel but he was even further from being a devil. And it cannot be rationally questioned that he had the support of a majority of the people of Venezuela. Um, he won four internationally monitored elections, plus a recall. Um, the latter, that recall, by the way, was partly financed by the United States, which would be illegal if some other country tried to do it here, but, you know, do as we say, not as we do. Uh, he also survived a coup in April 2002, a coup which the United States initially blamed on Chavez and then condemned only after it had failed. But having the support of your own populace will not save you from demonization. In fact, that's often the cause for it. Hugo Chavez upset the traditional apple cart. The traditional house of cards, where the poor in Venezuela were the other. They were the dispossessed, the ignored, the unimportant. The interest first of the rich and then of the middle class professionals got priority. Chavez instead openly championed the poor majority. Now he certainly made mistakes, lots of mistakes. For one, one serious one, he he depended way too much on the notion of continuing high oil prices uh, to the point where he failed to adequately reinvest in his own domestic oil industry. So when the price of oil sagged, the economy of Venezuela went south. But the bigger failing. Uh, now I, I, I have to say, this, it remains to be seen if this is actually a failing or not. It's going to depend on how things develop from here. But I believe this is true. Uh, and if I'm correct, this was a major, major philosophical failing on his part. The failing was not dealing with the risk that is run with any movement, especially ones that look for dramatic change. The possibility of that movement turning, however in unintentionally, into a personality cult. Into a cult, personality cult that cannot survive the symbol. Uh, the result of that is that both leaders and followers come to identify the benefit of the leader with the benefit of the movement as a whole. And the leader who starts saying uh, more and with more emphasis, they need me rather than I need them, is heading down a very dangerous path that in the long run usually winds up undermining what it is you set out to achieve in the first place. Venezuela never got to that point where everything was undermined. But it's been close enough that even now, you can see it on the horizon. Hugo Chavez needed to set about building a movement for change, one for empowering the poor, one for improvement of the lives of the, of the majority of the Venezuelan people, one even for uh, even a limited version of democratic socialism. He needed to create a movement that could survive his departure from public life and I sincerely fear that he failed to do so. I believe that Hugo, uh, Hugo Chavez was genuinely believed in his social revolution. I believe he was truly interested in giving the poor a power and a voice which they had never had before. I believe he genuinely, uh, genuinely wanted to cut poverty. In fact, poverty in Venezuela was cut in half during his time in office. I believe that he genuinely, want, uh, genuinely wanted to improve education, uh, health care, to feed the hungry. But to the very extent that his revolution became about him, to the very extent that uh, it does not have a structure that is independent of him and so will survive him, to that same extent in the long run he will have failed. 
he, ha he will have failed, while what follows possibly turning into exactly what his opponents accused him of. It has happened before. And that, especially considering what he and his movement have accomplished and have overcome, that indeed would be a very, very great shame. All right, I just got a few minutes left, probably about, about four or five minutes, I'm guessing, something like that. Um, I've got a couple of minutes left for our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Now this week, the outrage, and it is a very real one, is that in the wake of oral arguments, observers of the Supreme Court are saying that there are five votes on the court for striking down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. This is the section of the act that requires areas with a history of racial discrimination in voting practices to pre-clear any changes in their voting laws with the, uh, with the Department of Justice. Most but not all of those areas are in the South. There are some in the North, there are some in California. So they're not all in the South, but most of them are. Now, there is another section of the law, which is not really under attack, but that wouldn't stop this court from going after it anyway. There's another section of the law which probably will survive. Uh, that's Section 2 of the law. Now, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, dis the cases alleging racial discrimination can be brought against any jurisdiction in the country. The entire country is covered by it. But the thing is, these suits are much more expensive, and they are after the fact. These suits are about after the discrimination is and has been occurring such that it is a demonstrated pattern of discrimination. That's when the Justice Department can act, and not before. Section 5 is about preventing that before it happens. And that's the section that's at risk here. The case is Shelby County v. Holder. Shelby County, Alabama has argued that it should no longer be considered under Section 5, but it also argues that the renewal of the Voting Rights Act in 2006, uh, it was unconstitutional, they said, uh, the county argues, because it relied on, they said, outdated voting data to determine which jurisdiction should be covered by that provision. So they want the whole provision struck down and it appears at this point that the reactionary majority of the court is prepared to do that. Now the thing is the US Court of Appeals ruled against Shelby County in, in the lower court. What that court re-examined all the evidence that Congress used to renew the act in 2006. In its decision the court noted that of the cases over the past 40 years where racial discrimination has been proven, 81% of them occurred in areas covered by Section 5. But that, apparently, is no concern to the reactionary buffoons who make up the majority of the Supreme Court. Their notion of how you deal with racism is simply and essentially to declare it doesn't exist anymore. For example, Chief Justice John Roberts, um, whose picture is used in the dictionary to illustrate the word smug, wanted to know if the Justice Department, in defending the law, was saying that people who live in the South are more racist than people who live in the North. Which, besides the fact that some of these areas are not in the South that are covered by the section, it's completely irrelevant. The issue at hand is not the individual racism or who's more racist than who, but rather that a history, having a history of actively trying to prevent blacks and minorities from voting. He also claimed that Massachusetts has, quoting, the worst ratio of white voter turnout to African American voter turnout. Which, even if it's true, I don't know if it's true or not, but even if it is, again, it's irrelevant unless he's saying that Massachusetts has a history of actively suppressing minority voters. Justice Anthony Kennedy, now he treated Section 5, and by extension racism, as, as if it was a relic of some time long gone. The Marshall Plan was very good too, the Northwest Ordinance, the Morrill Act, but times change, he said. And then of course, there is Antonin Scalia, who suggested that the continuation of Section 5 was a perpetuation of racial entitlement, and Congress only renewed it because there was no political gain in voting against it. 
By the way, the vote in 2006 was 390 to 33 in the House and 98 to nothing in the Senate. Now, you likely already know that Antonin Scalia is a thoroughgoing scumbag. What you may not know is that he's in ineligible for the clown award because I thought that would be unfair to all the other possible clowns. I mean, have you actually read any of this guy's decisions? The guy's a dork. I have no idea how he got this reputation of being this great legal mind. I mean, yeah, he can cite case law, which any justice should be able to do, but his arguments often read like a concoction of, of uh, uh, sloganeering and non sequiturs. In the immortal words of Bugs Bunny, what a maroon. However, the important point here is that he still has a vote. And the right-wing wackos on the Supreme Court have revealed in their questions, in this case, in oral argument, they have revealed their real concern, which is partisan, or to be more precise, ideological advantage, ideological gain for the extreme right. It's not about the law, it's not about the Constitution, and it sure as hell is not about justice. It's about how they can turn back the clock, in this case, on voting rights. And that is a real outrage. All right, that's it for this week. I'm done. We're going to get out of here. Uh, we will see you next week. And um, in the meantime, feel free to email me with any comments or questions. Again, whoviating at AOL.com. Have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.